Next up is Mar Hershenson, uh, who's going to talk about entrepreneurship. Come on out, Mar. Mar is going to talk about creating successful founders. Please welcome Mar. Thank you. Well, I have a pretty positive and optimistic talk. I know the mood may be a little bearish in general. Uh, my name is Mar. I'm one of the founders of Pair VC. And I am very fortunate. I actually work with many startups. I've worked for the last decade with 100 plus startups. Uh, they're worth over $100 billion. And they all have one thing in common. When I invest, there's actually nothing. I'm the first check. There is no product. There's no customers. There's just the founders. So it is no surprise that I often wonder, are these founders born? Are my cards dealt as soon as I invest in one of these founders? Or is there anything I can do to change them? That's a big question. And I think many of you would say founders are born. Take, for example, Paul Merlucky. He's talking tomorrow. Um, he was a prodigy. Uh, he created the first prototype of the Oculus Rift at 17, and he sold the company to Facebook at 22. Clearly, there's something special about him. Or Melanie Perkins. She started her first, her first business at 14, then at 19 went on to build the largest yearbook business in Australia, and now she runs one of the most successful startups. And then Elon Musk. I don't think I need to say anything. He's definitely someone special. Um, something in his DNA, right? Uh, so you wouldn't be surprised. Many people ask me what makes a good founder. And there's a bunch of characteristics. You can Google it. Uh, people come up with a bunch of things like risk taking, resilience, ambition, etc. And in fact, there's some research by academia that shows that people have some innate properties. So uh, researchers at Northeastern surveyed a hundred, hundreds of entrepreneurs, and they counted that 42% of them had started a business as a kid. So actually, that's a good hint for anybody making angel investments. Maybe it's a question you can ask. Now, there's also data that shows that founders can be made. And while there are 37% of founders, the repeat founders in companies today, 59% repeat founders are in the top unicorns. So that means at least you learn something from your first experience. So it would be reasonable to believe that there is some relationship about you know, what's your chances of being successful to how you're born. However, I do believe there is some form, something you can do, right? There's some energy or some modification that would put you up in that chart. And I think the wider arrow shows that at the early parts of that chart, you need a lot of effort. And in fact, this is what I've learned from being an investor. Roughly, and these are all rough numbers, out of the 10 companies we back, two will fail, no matter what we do. That's just almost their destiny. Um, and Jason wrote a blog post in 2015, so that's a long time ago, um, that's titled, You Don't Have What It Takes. I recommend you reading it. And basically the summary is, some people just don't have what it takes. It would take so much effort to change them that you might as well give up, right? Okay, so now out of 10 companies we back, two will succeed no matter what. You know, us people in venture like to take credit, um, but truly the founders, there's a percentage of founders that work independently of us. Um, we backed DoorDash early on, there's a picture of their founders, and I can tell you that Tony Hsu, the CEO, would have made it with or without any of his investors. And then there are six companies, that I think we can influence, okay? There's something we can do. Um, and the question is perhaps, what could you do with that 60%? How can you make them more successful? Or maybe better, if you're at the top 10%, can you accelerate their success? That's a big question. And that's what I'm really passionate about. Can you create more successful entrepreneurs? And why is it important? Why should you care? Um, 
I think, I think this is the right audience. You don't have to say. There are many numbers to show that having more entrepreneurs is good for the economy. Um, you can read them, but just more entrepreneurs means a better world. So the question is, how can you build these entrepreneurs? Is there a magic machine where you can actually take a regular founder or a regular person and out comes a successful founder? Okay. So at the risk of being elitist, I am going to say that one of the closest machines of entrepreneurship is Stanford University. And the numbers actually show it. 10% of unicorns have founders that attend at Stanford. And what's even more, in the All In Summit, I actually went through all the LinkedIn's, 40% of the speakers attend at Stanford. And I think all of us have started something, whether it's 538 like Nate or a venture firm or a company or multiple companies. So there's some special gene, right? And the question is, what does Stanford have that other people don't have, right? It's a higher ed institution. So for sure, you're going to go and take some classes, gain some skill sets. They put you around people that are uh, like you and they have a brand. So you have access to capital, network, Etc. Having been there though, I will tell you that the skill set doesn't quite matter as much. You can go online and learn some of that. But your peers around you and the next degree around you actually really, really matter. And in a way, what these people are doing is transforming your character. And I, I can tell you that firsthand. Just imagine yourself, you may be a founder or an investor, I don't know. You are dropped in a world where you basically are surrounded by people that are constantly thinking about starting new companies. This is smart people. The ambition is very, very high. There is innovation almost breathing everywhere. And nerding out is very OK, right? So by doing this throughout years, you actually become one of them. And your peers are really fundamentally changing your character. You become somebody that starts to believe in themselves. You can do it. Uh, you learn basically to expand your own ambition, right? You may think 100 million exit is good, but if you go to Stanford, you know that's not good enough, right? So you're setting your own bar. Um, it's a really interesting process. And the question is, are there other machines like this? Or is Stanford just the only way to do it? But the good news is there are other places that do this, or there are other forms of doing this, I would say. And one of them, Perhaps it's the PayPal Mafia. I think a lot of them running around here in the next couple of days. You all know that they started many successful companies, Tesla, LinkedIn, Palantir, Affirm, YouTube, Yelp, Yammer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, there's something magic about having been there at that point in time. I haven't researched them, and I don't have that much direct contact, but According to Sarah Lacey, who's a journalist, and she spent a lot of time researching them, she concluded there was the confidence that they gained when they were there. Now, I'm not sure, but maybe in the Q&A, they will reveal the secret. There's other mafias. This one I'm more familiar with. This is Rappi. Rappi is a company that was founded in 2015, so not, not that long ago, in Colombia. And it really transformed the Latin startup environment. There's been 100 plus companies created by Rappi employees. It's crazy. Even almost 50 in Colombia. It almost, it literally changed the country, which is a big deal. I have uh, the privilege of working with a few of these founders, and there's something common in them. They all have this sense of ambition that, you know, super fast growth. It's, it's really interesting how they're almost cut from the same cloth. So there are other places. And I think we had the mayor here earlier. Um, I guess he would claim that Miami is on its way to doing some of that. So there are places. So I want to tell you about a couple of experiments that are personal to me that I've been running and hopefully will inspire you um, to do something on your own. OK. The first one is I teach a class um, at Stanford. It's a startup simulation class. Uh, you have to. For one sec, forget it's at Stanford. I'm actually taking it to other colleges as well. It's not your usual class, OK? So it's actually not your usual class in the sense that I never lecture. There is no lectures from me. There's almost no communication from me. 
So um, I've been teaching this class for six years. We will take eight teams. These teams have four to five people. And you cannot have a startup when you come to this class. In fact, you must be way earlier. You only have an idea, or you may have a couple of ideas. But if you have something that you've been working on for a while, you're automatically disqualified, OK? So everybody that comes in knows very, very little. Um, and then what the class is designed to do is to just maximize your peers' interaction. Because I believe that that's the way that you can create founders. So how do we do that? First, we're very lucky that I can actually craft the class. So even within Stanford, you have to get admitted to this class. There's only 20% acceptance. So I'm able to figure out who do we want to get, get in. And then the trick is to force each of the teams to present to each other every week. And I know it sounds really simple, but just by doing that, you're actually motivating and teaching by example. And the results are pretty incredible. We actually have one to three companies per year that get started. I think we have two unicorns. There are 600 million capital raised. And I think what's really, really interesting is that every year I'll get some pretty nerdy PhD student that goes off to be a successful founder. So it's, it's very impressive. And this one, which is really interesting, uh, when I first started, 20% of the kids were females. And I said, well, we need, we, we, I bet we can shape the class. So throughout the years, we've been increasing female enrollment. And I can tell you that the results have not changed. We actually now have more female-founded companies. And this is actually something I care about. So I went, <laughs> thank you. OK, so this takes me to my second experiment, which is actually even more successful and has nothing to do with Stanford, OK? So there's no Stanford involved. OK, so um, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I decided, let's get a group of women together artificially. And again, the same idea. These women cannot be founders, OK? These are women that are just high potential, OK? And we actually have 30 to 40 women per cohort. We've done it twice. Um, and the goal is like, hey, can we teach them about being a founder, increase their confidence, their ambition, their risk taking, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we do it? Same thing. First thing is we inspire them with great leaders. So we would bring women that are successful in their own right to tell them that it is possible to be like them, right? I think in many occasions, we just lack that role model. And the next is we force them to connect with each other. So sometimes it's talks, sometimes it's fun events or dinners. We even had a manicure, pedicure session. The point is that can you get them to talk to each other? And the results are literally insane. So we had 78 women through the process. Uh, I think they've incorporated 45 plus companies. 35 of them have raised more than a million dollars. And they're backed by people like Sequoia, and Reason, Paradigm, Dragonfly, and of course, Pear. Um, so, I mean, it's incredible numbers. These are not regular numbers that you would see in a random group of people. And I think, again, it's important because I think we have something to say about what, thank you, about what the next generation looks, right? I mean, it's for all of us in the audience, 2% of all companies have an all-female founder team. That is very crazy, if you can imagine, if you can do the numbers. So, um, you know, I think perhaps Richard Branson said it better. Everyone is born an entrepreneur, and everyone has the potential to learn to be an entrepreneur. It's just that not everyone gets the opportunity, right? So I think my quest is about making those opportunities. And I will say that you, as an individual, have your first responsibility about doing that, right? You have to create opportunities for yourself. And I would say the most important is to surround yourself by the best people. So you have to play up and challenge yourself. And sometimes, uh, you know, people don't go to places that have the best people because they have a, um, the worst job at the company, and that's the wrong attitude. You should go to wherever the best people are so you can learn, you know, transform yourself. 
Um, I have two very practical pieces of advice that I give my founders. First, this is very simple, but you can actually read. You can read a lot. Um, one of my founders asked Drew, uh, who's the founder of Dropbox, how he became a great CEO, and he said, I read a lot. But then I have actually gone and looked at our top 10% of our portfolio, and there's one thing those CEOs have in common. They are reading machines. So I don't know if reading will make you a great CEO, but I know it won't hurt you. So, and the second one is get a coach. I say even Steve Jobs had a coach. If you don't have money to get a coach, get a peer group, because again, it's about character building. And I think what investors can do, so if you're an investor in the room, um, I know it's a very ego high business, but it is not about us, you know. We are not the ones who make the companies. I think our role is to have, create opportunities for our founders to grow. And that actually will help the portfolio. And I think for society, perhaps we should have an early intervention program, much like a gifted program in schools. If you detect that there are kids that have that gene in them, why not pull them aside and create an early intervention program? And, and I'll give you an analogy, which you'll understand. I'm from Barcelona, Spain. My fellow countrywoman is Montserrat Caballé. She was a great opera singer. And of course, today, probably I'm too old to become a great opera singer, but perhaps I, wouldn't, I would have had some chance, right? Uh, maybe to just sing opera in the bathroom at some point if I had been taught early on. So that's the thought. And you know, just imagine a world where you can actually increase the total founder potential by just 10% or even shape who becomes to be a founder. So with that, I guess I'll go to the Q&A. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. In the middle. You're in the middle. Yes. That's amazing. What a great talk. That's I mean, amazing. This is very intimidating. I know, but <laughs> somehow the four of us are going to get through it. It was an incredible talk. Somehow. Um, God, you're good. I have to say, you know, we're watching the talk backstage and the nodding that we were each having and, you know, collectively we've invested in, you know, I would say closer to a thousand companies now and we're nodding and thank you for putting my blog post up there from, from years ago, you don't have what it takes. And I just realized, you know, wow, it, one of the fundamental problems we have, and I think having David here from the PayPal mafia speaks volumes, one of the fundamental problems in entrepreneurship is that you pointed out is people have to see it in order to be it. And you know, when you look at what happened at PayPal, and I'm really interested in hearing David's perspective on this, they got to see each other at Stanford, and 40% of the speakers have been to Stanford here at this event. I didn't even know that. Uh, Thank you for incredible. doing that statistic. Yeah. But it seems like the fundamental problem we have in society, you can expand this, and then we were talking about how uh, the mayor being Are on Are you before, getting to a question? Yeah, <laughs> and the many, rest of us have questions. But this is the fundamental problem. We need people to understand that entrepreneurship and opportunity in this country is available to 100% of the people here. They have that opportunity, but because they don't see someone like themselves, a woman, a person of color, a person of, a woman who is a person of color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they need to see it to be it. That's the problem, isn't it? Well, you summarized it really well. And I asked you to do the talk next time. Well, I listened. <laughs> I listened to that. Yes. When you, when you started this program, what was your goal? What did you think was gonna happen? Honestly, I didn't think it was gonna be, I, I didn't think the conclusion was gonna be as, as big, right? I mean, if you get 20% of women to start a business, that would have been amazing. But we're getting almost, I would say, 60% of them or 70% of them are going off and starting a business. It's crazy. I mean, when you take both of those two programs together, the, the results are pretty- Crazy. They're pretty crazy. Yes. Um, so, okay, take it out of the Stanford context for a second. Um, how do people, I'll pick a city, you know, you're, you're in Cincinnati. What does it mean to have a peer group and a network that yes. can create or catalyze like a PayPal like mafia there, or even if it's in Miami or in LA or wherever you are, that seems like a really hard 
It's a really hard problem. So luckily I'm young enough that I'll, I'll be able to but iterate. Zoom, but Zoom may make that a little bit easier it too, might, right? I think you need that, you know, it's not just enough to get a bunch of people together, right? You have to seed it the right way. So that's why I said, you know, even for the female program, we'll get hundreds of applications and we have to go and interview everybody and see who can have high potential, right? So again, uh, there's a little bit on the choosing of who goes into that program and then you can shape them. So again, it's that curve. If you are too far to the left, then your job is really, really high. I used to probably once a week read Business Insider or Insider. And then I stopped about seven months ago, or no, maybe like in the last few months. And I'll tell you why I stopped. It was for two reasons. There was this article that they kept running, basically bashing the founder of Glossier. And to me, it just didn't make any sense because it's like, there are lots of people who you know, go through trials and tribulations at startups. And when you read about her journey, it didn't seem particularly different than anybody else. You try products, some of them work, some of them fail, you learn and you move on. But they would run it and they were just hammering, hammering, hammering. They did it with the Away founder too. Away, and, you know, there's the, a term away luggage thing, which was the craziest story. Unbelievable. Like, so that's like, Stuart, so, I, you know. I, I read that story. I was like, what did she do wrong? I never really understood. Yeah, what she said everybody work harder. Yeah. yeah, she was like, work harder. Let's make this One company a success. Does that I give him a raise. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think... Uh, <laughs> Can I give you more equity? Yeah. Well, I think, honestly, that happens even to me. I mean, on board meetings, I look, you know, I'm not an asshole, I'm a bitch, right? That's the, yeah. that's the summary of the situation. Yeah. Welcome to the club. We're assholes. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's so the, that's why I stopped reading it, because I was like, this is really ridiculous, because yeah. what is it telling people? And then separately, they kept running this ad promoting this company called Cerebral, which last week got a DOJ subpoena for selling Adderall illegally to people. And so it's like, this is the imbalance that you see when things are presented that don't really make a lot of sense to There's me. a term for it in the industry, um, and I didn't come up with the term, chicks for clicks. And so they will look for a female founder what and know chicks for clicks. Chicks for clicks? Chicks, as in a, worm for, a word for females, chicks for clicks. They're, they're all trying to get clicks. If you go after a female founder, you're gonna get 10 times as many clicks. Oh, really? It's just yeah, more exciting. Of course. Um, the Theranos but, story, I think, like, was such a great example of that. It was like a failed biotech company. I'm not saying that there wasn't fraud and stuff that happened there, but man, I mean, the way that that, that escalated, the storyline, yeah, it, it was- I noticed as well. I mean, yeah. it's a founder plus a female founder. You know, a founder misbehaving, quote unquote, plus a female founder just yeah. equals a little more. I'm Even the wife of the founder of WeWork is more famous in some circles. She seemed more talented. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm curious what your questions are for David about the magical moment of the PayPal mafia. Yeah, what was the, what was the secret sauce? Like being the 17th most important guy at PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> He's now the ninth. He's what were your, moving what were up. No, he was clearly yeah, the fifth or you sixth. Tried, you yeah. tried that joke already during your intros. <laughs> yeah. It didn't work. Don't try and don't try and resuscitate it now. You had your chance uh, okay. on the pod. Okay, yeah. That was brutal. Yeah, I know. I felt no, no I apologize to the entire fan base for yeah. Freebird's intros. Come on. Um, Look, I'll tell you something. Every guy on the stage, no one will ever tell them what I said because everyone works for him or wants money from him. So we can only do it to each other. <laughs> we can okay. only do it to each other. All right, uh, what all right. so, so the, an the, the answer is that at PayPal, we recruited our friends to work at the company because literally nobody else like was willing to come work at this crazy startup. Peter recruited his friends who he had gone to college with at Stanford. Max recruited his friends from U of I. That's how the initial team was recruited is through friendship networks. But it wasn't like this was some exclusive club. It's just that nobody else wanted to be a member. And- um, <laughs> Well, sorry, know. can I just say at yeah. Facebook early days, it was exactly like that as well. It's like, we had like really qualified people from great schools, but it would not be the people that you would have thought. It's like the folks that like spun out of Microsoft you know, couldn't succeed. And all of a sudden we were like, oh, or like Boz used to teach Zuck CS. And it's like, yeah, why don't you just come in as like the, the TA of the class? It was not, it was the, very ragtag. Did, did the trust make everyone, because they all knew each other from before, did the trust give everyone like a stronger sense of like being vulnerable and then developing themselves better? Because I do see like a lot vulnerable. of these. Vulnerable. Well, I mean, I see a lot of these companies and everyone's, all, it's all like a, it's like you see early stage companies and it's very political, who's gonna last, who's not? Because you don't really trust each other. You never work right. together. 
Well, like what you I, know each other. Yeah, what I'd say is that you, you would think that the, the friendships would, would make it like this sort of um, calm, friendly environment. Uh, PayPal was actually a very um, frictional, contentious environment. Right. And, but I do think that there is a trust element to it, which is we were constantly debating what the truth was right. and what we needed to do and what the big risks to the big business were. And so we were yelling. In fact, Peter, when he hired me, he told some of the other people on the team, look, I want to hire David because I need someone here who I can yell at. <laughs> and meaning, like, he didn't have to worry about hurting my feelings. He could just say what he really thought, and we could have an open conversation about what we need to do as a company, even if it meant yelling. So was it a culture of brutal honesty? Yes, think? absolutely. Like, yeah, that's what totally. Vinod talks about a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. Can, I ask, can I ask you guys a question, Mar and David? You use R Rappi. So the last time I was here in Miami was to meet the Rappi founders, and I spent a couple of days with them. And I came away stunned, kind of like what you said. I didn't realize it was that extensive, but there's a really special culture there. Yes. PayPal obviously had that as well. But do you guys, and I, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but do you have to have somewhat more of a bounded outcome for then these networks to really explode. Meaning, if you look at a Google or a Facebook or even a Microsoft, when companies become almost too successful, it almost just locks these folks in and the incentive to go off with that toolkit, the peer network, goes to zero because you're just too incentivized. It's an and interesting evolutionary point. trait, right? Or people make so much money that they just retire. I That's what he's saying, yeah. You're yeah. totally right. The companies that they come from have to be a little hard. I don't Still think hungry. PayPal was easy, right? No, it's super hard, yeah. Um, and when it's hard, you learn to be, you know, to overcome hard things. And the whole company learns if there's brutal honesty, right? If it's hidden at the top and you think it's all right, nobody learns. But if you do, you do. And actually, I think the, the rate of success of people that came out of founder of Google, relatively speaking, is not that high. Not that high. It's not that high, because everything works. And no, everything, no is offense, easy. everything is easy. No offense, Everything is easy. But no, Freeberg, you run. Well, he's a oh, Google. Shit. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Right there, Google. But you're saying the Google people, Mar, to be clear, got very soft they because just it was learned. too easy. They Mushy. never learned. They never learned like, anything. Like they Freeberg. never learned. Like an exactly. overcooked yeah. quinoa. Right. You know, there, yes. there are more, this is actually interesting. There are more unicorns founded by ex PayPal people than ex Google yeah. people, even though at the, sort of the PayPal mafia, if you define it as the pre IPO, uh, group of people who worked at PayPal, there were only a couple of hundred well, in the Bay Area, whereas Google had like 10,000. So, so my, my theory on this, having observed it, I, at the early days of Google, the, 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 the organization grew, the success of the company was exponential out of the fucking gate. I mean, like more than most companies we talk about nowadays. Um, and as a result, all of the success was baked in. The, the, the monopoly machine started rolling right away. So then the hires started being safer hires, people that could be more analytical, people that could be more execution oriented, not risk takers. And so a lot of people were hired, and I for, forgive, I went to Cal, but forgive me for saying, but all the Stanford people who um, basically had always done really well on their SATs, got great grades, they'd always been successful. They'd always you know, kind of been given that thumbs up, you're awesome, you're smart, come here and do this job. They weren't the risk takers. They weren't the people who were willing to take risk to fail. And so the orientation was build a culture of people that just took, didn't take a lot of risk, executed. And then those people, they had this false sense of entrepreneurial success by working at Google because they were already on a rocket ship. Then a bunch of them left and tried to start companies. And they're like, oh, yeah, you just build an app and 100 million people use it. It's like, dude, failure, 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 failure. Oh, and by the way, if you make it to 87 failures, then you'll have your moment of success. And none of them make it past point 0.30. Right, and so I think, like my observation, with so many Google people I knew that left and started companies, they either weren't risk takers or they didn't have the the grit and persistence needed to go through the failure to get there. And it was because that culture was defined by early success, and then everyone that joined was just execution operations oriented. Hundred percent. Yeah. You mentioned something. Maybe you can just speak a little bit more about it. But we used to do these things, which you talked about, where every week you would force people basically to present. And what you're almost doing, and I think what we learned was you're desensitizing people to failure itself. And it just becomes a nothing burger because totally. you're just seeing this litany of just randomly bad ideas almost. Um, but that's what becomes so powerful because then these random little things just become enormous. They shape uh, you. They shape you. And that's you get very, very lucky. I remember like when, you know, at Facebook, we created, I created this thing called Growth Circle. We used to run thousands of experiments a week and we used to have folks present every week. 
and it was just three hours of monotonous failure, right? It was just one after another, after another. But I think what it really did was allow people to feel okay trying the crazy idea, yeah. Because they would see the fifteen people in front of them wouldn't do it. Totally. So is that was that the key? Is that, that really is the, the key. key? That is actually the key, and actually it makes a huge difference, right? If you yeah. hear every and and you, they also inspire you. Whoever is actually doing great, you're like, I don't want to be the last person, you know, the next week when I have to present. I want to be better than the person that presented last week and did great. But how do you so get it motivates a, you? But Mar, how do you get people that are those high SAT overachiever types to be okay? Yeah, kind you of, have to put them in a position. So I'll tell you like one, for example, in the class, one exercise you can tell people towards the end. It's like, you know, they're all having some startup or have some users or whatever. They don't know how to start up, they have a project. Um, I'll say, okay, your homework for next week is to 10X your sales. You have one week to do it. And people get really, really creative when you actually tell them that. And maybe they don't get to 10, but they'll get to two or three in a week. And I think that inspiration is enough for people to make the best out of themselves. I think great leaders do that, right? They ask for more than you think is cap you're capable. Yeah. People are capable. What about learning failure, right? We were talking about this on, yes. the, on the, 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 yesterday we were um, having a conversation about, you know, how do we make sure that our kids grow up and learn failure like we all learned? And failure ultimately, I think, and persistent failure, I think really taught me a lot uh, about, you know, putting up with failure, knowing that there's, as long as you're doing the right thing, you'll get there probabilistically. Um, how do you teach that? Because, you know, folks, especially in an environment where they've always been successful, uh, and how do you keep them from saying, you know what, I don't want to fail, I want to succeed because my orientation is to succeed. So when they start to fail, they run and they go do something easy, which totally. they can succeed at. Totally, and actually at. at Stanford specifically, right? Yeah, exactly. If you made it to Stanford Not to keep bashing Stanford, but yeah. No, yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just, I went to Cal for the but you are very, I mean, you've, you've been an incredible student. I mean, you probably cured cancer or something if right. you had to, if you got into Stanford today, right? So you're, uh, any, they've, they've never really failed at life. This right. is an 18 year old that's never suffered failure, uh, at least um, as we understand it. You have to put them, you have to learn each of the students, what is their weak point and make them actually do that, right? So yeah, one of the things I will do- To induce failure. Yeah, you provoke failure as quickly as you can. So, you know, if you're a typical, uh, you know, computer science student, you probably can create an app. Well, these days, within an hour, you'll have something great, right? Try to get a thousand users yeah. without spending a single dollar. Let them fail. Can you do it? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. And then do it again. And some of them, the, you know, the mental health problem is very, very high, right? I think a lot of these people, the first time they fail, they can't take it. Let me ask you one more because my, my and I'm sorry, Jacob, but my, my, my big three predictors of entrepreneurial success are grit, persisting through failure, bias to action. Like you don't have an orientation to being analytical, you have an orientation to taking action, um, and uh, a narrative. Because I think that the greatest entrepreneurs that we all know, Elon's obviously the penultimate example, some, someone told me I use that word wrong, so I won't yeah, use it. Penultimate means second. <laughs> ultimate, is, ultimate is what you're going for. Yeah, I feel like you're wrong on that, but I'll accept it. Um, it so, may be the quinoa getting to your yeah, brain, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. He you had, may want some protein. He had the ultimate definition, you had the penultimate I definition. Eat more, more like mink steaks. So, um, how does narrative get learned? Because we've seen that the best entrepreneurs are incredible storytellers. Yes. They tell the story and they tell the vision before it's built as a way of attracting the best talent, and then as a way of attracting the capital, and then as a way of attracting customers. And that, yes. that ability is key to success. And how do you actually, okay, so is there a way to develop really narrative? Okay, that's really important, um, you know, and I'm gonna even elevate it one more. Sales, you have to be a great salesperson. Your narrative, you're selling the story of your company, but you may be selling to, a to an employee, to an investor, totally. or whatever. You need to be a great salesperson. Unfortunately, teaching sales at a higher institution educational institution is considered like dirty work. So we don't yeah. even teach it, right? But it's the most important thing. So, you know, I run a little accelerator and we just like Jason, and we spend the last few weeks just teaching people how to talk. You know, how do you explain what you do? And, you know, I tell people there's nothing like practice. You have to practice, practice, get yeah. coach, etc. Some people are born with that. Some people you actually have to learn. You think it, you think it is learned though? It is. It, it is learnable. Well, you can definitely get better, yeah. right? 
If yeah. not, the world would be a better, a sad hey, place. Mars, we wrap here. Yes. Uh, we have 10 daughters between the four of us. I love We're that. We're all dads. Yeah. Three, Three. Two, two, two. Three? Three. Whatever. <laughs> uh, you can remind David of the names of his daughters. Um, <laughs> he, they're on your watch. I'll look them up. Um, Mar, what can He's you... got a little card in here. <laughs> I'd like to My thank... My wife's name is... <laughs> so... like He's got a picture. A little picture. Yeah. <laughs> Mar, um, <laughs> what have you learned uh, about uh, women uh, in terms of entrepreneurship? What, what do we need to know about encouraging them to become entrepreneurs and to create companies? Um, you know, I think the most important is for women to believe in themselves. I think a lot of us don't. I think you Google imposter syndrome and we all have it, even myself coming here today. I was probably the person that practiced the most because I have that imposter syndrome. Um, that is the most important. You have to overcome that because for most men, it comes naturally, right? And us, we have to work a little harder to do that. But with confidence, we make amazing founders, I would say. And, you know, I am fortunate to work with many of them. This year, our accelerator, this session, what we present on Wednesday, will have two thirds of the founders are women. That's very impressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're amazing. I'm not, you know, they're not. There's no cutting corners. The are the best people. But we as a society have to do a better job of... Um, Stop can, clicking on those clicks, you know, chicks for clicks. Yeah, exactly. Stop clicking. Uh, <laughs> and, well, and I think maybe, uh, you know, them seeing more role models role like models you. Yeah. And I think very specifically, you know, we as all girl dads appreciate the work you're doing. Oh, thank you. Let's give it up for Mark. Besties are I'm back. Going.